The following interview was conducted with Joe McConnell, the play-by-play -play football announcer for the Purdue football from 95 to date for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, January 14, 2010 at his residence in Indianapolis. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. McConnell, and welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years, grade well, school. I'm a native Hoosier. I was born in Rochester, Indiana in 1939, and it so happened that my first next door neighbor was Clyde Beatty, who was the, one of the all-time famous animal trainers. Oh my gosh. The circus used to quarter in Rochester and Peru, Indiana. Sure. Uh, the Ringling Brothers, all the big circuses used to quarter there because of the uh, railroad sites. Uh-huh. And uh, they, they, could, they could manage the cold weather until the big fire of 41 in Peru, which burned them out, and that's, uh, they wound up moving then to, uh, to Florida. Okay. But uh, anyway, Clyde Beatty was uh, our next door neighbor, and uh, I think somebody took a picture of me one time playing with one of his little tiger cubs. <laughs> uh, I must have been all of a couple of months old. But, uh, <laughs> you start I, young with animals, right? It, well, <laughs> more or less. I, I'm, just, I'm a dog lover. I got two dogs now and wouldn't trade them for anything. <laughs> That's about as wild as I get, though, when it comes to animals. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, that, that's just kind of an interesting side note. Uh, sure. My dad was a banker. Uh, he, he started, he was a legacy uh, freshman at IU and didn't like it down there. Went a year and wound up going to the uh, International School of Business in Fort Wayne. Okay. And he was a small town banker in Rochester when I was born. And uh, right after the start of the war, he enlisted into the Navy. And we moved in with our grandparents, which, who lived in Kiwana, Indiana, which is in Fulton County. Uh, Rochester was the county seat, Fulton County, uh, Kiwana was just a small town about eight miles away. And it was odd, another oddity, my, when I started grade school there was uh, 45, the end of the war, and I went to first grade, and my grade school, my first grade teacher was the same teacher that Doc Bowen, the former governor of Indiana, had my about 50 years earlier. My goodness, what a uh, small world. <laughs> it is. Right. It is, it is. But anyway, uh, we, we moved to Goodland, Indiana then after that first year. My dad came back from the war, and there were no building supplies in a lumber yard that, that he and my grandfather owned. So. He decided he was going to build a theater, and we moved back to Goodland, Indiana, where my grandmother's family had been, and my dad could not find the funds or could not find the uh, building supplies to build a theater because of the GI housing bill. Mm -hmm. He wound up, so he wound, it was, turned out to be the best break of his life because about four years later, TV would have put us out of business. <laughs> but uh, he wound up being a Culligan man. And uh, he had enough, he could get enough building supplies to build a chicken coop, and then he elevated it on concrete blocks, and that was the business. And he ran that uh, all the way, uh, all through my school years, and then he went back into the banking business the year I graduated from high school. He sold the business and moved to Lake County. But I grew up in Newton County, Goodland, Indiana, small town. There were 22 in my graduating class. I was one of four students in, uh, in Goodland to go to Franklin. I was the first one to decide, and everybody else said, well, I, I guess we'll go there, too. <laughs> and the only reason I picked Franklin College is because I hadn't even given college much of a second thought other than I'd probably wind up going somewhere. And uh, we wound up going to Franklin uh, during the fall break uh, for a newspaper uh, uh, um, yearbook uh, staff sure. uh, meetings. And, uh, it was a small college just far enough to be away from home, and that's where I decided I wanted to go to school. So I majored in history and PE and uh, graduated from Franklin College in 62, five and a, or four and a half years. That last half year, I started my professional radio career. I was going to ask with, you about that. Yeah, right. with a little station that opened up in Franklin. It uh -huh. was an FM station. They hired me for a dollar and a dime an hour. I turned it on in the morning. I shut it off at night. Uh, I filled out the logs. I did just about everything sure. that you could do, and uh, that was my start. I had met Johnny DeCamp when I was uh, about 10 years old. Uh, our oh. family physician was a former Purdue uh, team doctor for a couple of years, and he became friends with DeCamp, and he found out what a big Purdue fan I was growing up and what a big John DeCamp fan I was, that he, had, he invited John and Ann DeCamp uh, to come up and visit him one night and had my dad and I over for me to meet him. Oh, isn't it? So um, I had met Johnny when I was about 10 years old, and uh, uh, I kept in contact with him. I, I sent him a resume. I ran into him at a, at a uh, broadcaster's convention dinner for the Final Four that year I graduated from college, and so I sent him my resume and the whole nine yards. turned out he needed a guy, and so he hired me. 
Oh, isn't that great? And so that's that was my start at Purdue. Sure. Okay. Did you have any? Were you in the military at any time, Joe? National Guards. Oh, okay. That was a thing. That was a way to go in those days. And I joined when I was when I was uh, 16 years old. Okay. And uh, that lasted until I was married and had a couple of kids. Oh, okay. Well, that's all right. So tell us a little about what you did with the radio station when you came here, and then when you became. The assistant sports information director. Well, well, I was a chief announcer. Is what they it was what the title was, uh, uh-huh. and, and I worked with students to learn. Uh, you know, I had taught them how to pronounce Bach instead of Batch, and uh, <laughs> Beethoven instead of Beethoven, and and uh, in other words, I taught them classical music, gave them the basics, uh, did help them do station breaks, and uh, and on my own behalf, I did everything but book reviews. I did the stock markets, I did the sports, I did did a little bit of everything. Sure. I can still remember being in the uh, uh, the day that John Kennedy was shot, um, and, and we after we first got word, we all went down to the wire. There was a little separate room where the news, where Associated Press uh, wire was, and we were standing there staring at that machine, uh, reading about how he had died on the at the Parkland Hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was uh, that's something that's kind of stuck with you, but uh, sure. Purdue was a great training ground for me. Um, I did the high school sports and got to do a couple of games with the camp. One when his color color man couldn't make it, I went to Iowa with him to do a football game, and then he got laryngitis. Uh, <laughs> While you were uh, at the game? What, no, he oh. got laryngitis. He got laryngitis a couple of years later, and I got to do the Purdue IU game basketball game down in Bloomington. He went with me and was there, but didn't but didn't speak. You were the one in charge, huh? Well, no, I wasn't in charge, but I got to do the <laughs> you game. You and the, yeah, right. <laughs> he, was the, he was the man in charge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where was was WBA? Was it in the same place it is now, in the, um, down the ground? Um, well, yeah, it's been completely renovated, but okay. it, was in the, it was in the Hall of Music. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I imagine there was some, but that was the, the site where it was originally yes, then. Yes, yes. All right. What did you do as the assistant sports information director, Joe? Was uh, that? I left, uh, I left BAA a couple years later. A uh, local guy in town liked my work, and uh, he, was a, he was a station manager at Channel 18. Okay. And so I went across town, so to speak, and did the weather on a green board. It was all black and white back in those days anyway, and green looked better than black. Sure. And uh, I did the weather and then uh, ran a camera when the newsman, Mike Ungersman, was on, and then when I did the sports, he ran a camera for me. Oh, okay. And I was the program director out there, which meant I got to go through the uh, small file of films that Channel 4 ran about eight times a year and pick out ours to run at the same time because we were a Circus Tarzian station. Mm-hmm. And those were my duties out there. I was also the only the first guy to do any local high school basketball play-by-play on television. Um, we, did, we did high school games for the first time, and uh, we used to set up on the stages and some of the other places. and. Uh, we had, we had a couple of cameras, and we did a Game of the Week program my last year there. Super. Boy, well, you really got in on the ground floor there. Yeah, well, sure. that's how you sure. learn in the, in the broadcast business. That's you right. start to bomb and work up. At least I did. Now, sure. Um, I also learned how to shoot film, and because we had uh, we only, uh, we only had a brand-new processor, which was a new deal in those days, we didn't have one for a long time. So uh, I had a handheld 16-millimeter bell and howl. I would go to the Purdue basketball games in the old field house, and I'd shoot it, edit it. In other words, I would I would do my cutaway shots, and I'd plan them. I'd, I'd shoot a little bit of the action, then I'd put a cutaway shot in there, and everything, so that when I put it in the when I put it in the processor, when I got it back to the station, uh-huh. and it took an hour or two to run through the processor. Oh, I imagine. Um, we ran it wet. Huh. In other words, it would it came right out of the processor, and we had it just in time for the 10 o'clock news or whatever the late sure. newscast was and there were times that we would literally run it wet through the camera <laughs> so I would, nobody had time to edit anything you had to learn how to do that as you were shooting it that's right that was kind of a unique uh, uh, learning experience sure I would, <laughs> i'd say so absolutely sounds good to me <laughs> now let's see then after that do you want to talk a little bit about the times you know uh, i know you did national football league and basketball and some of those things and the super bowl so i'll, I'll leave that up to you those times before you came back to Purdue. I'll well, let you... I'll, I'll quickly say I left, I left uh, Channel 18 in a couple of years. Well, before I left 18, I became uh-huh. the assistant sports director at Purdue. Okay. Uh, Carl Cloggis was the sports information director at that time. He had a full-time secretary, and uh, he had three or four student interns, and, he, and George Bollinger, who was a sports writer at the, at the General Courier, and I were part-time employees. And that's all we had in the sports information department at that time. That was before Channel 9, or Channel 9, before Title IX, 
and uh, uh, so there were no female sports at all, sure. and there were like eight sports to cover. Wow. So I got to lay out the I got to lay out the, pr the football programs and do a lot of other stuff that I wouldn't have got to do otherwise, sure. and and uh, help help uh, raise a couple of young kids at that time, and uh, I also got to run the press box, and those were during the uh, that was during the first Rose Bowl year. That was uh, Malenkov's uh, height of Malenkov's career. That was when Bob Greasy was there and Leroy Keyes sure. and Perry Williams and all those guys. Great. Maybe the maybe the best decade of Purdue football ever. Yeah, was, so that was kind of a cool time to be a part of that. Right, and you got to go. You went to that Rose Bowl, didn't you? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I spotted for Lindsey Nelson uh, on the NBC TV. That was the first time my name ever got mentioned nationally on TV. I was going to spot for Hilliard Gates, who did the Purdue Indiana together. They did a kind of a game of the week thing for Fort Wayne, and Hilliard was a big time sportscaster in those days. And he was going to do the national radio, and he wanted. I had spotted for him some during the year, so he wanted me to, to spot with him on radio. But then, uh, when uh, Lindsey Nelson said they needed somebody, uh, Cloggett stuck me in there. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, that's very, very nice. And I know uh, afterwards I was going to ask you about the other one, but this it was nice that you were able to go to our two that we, we were out there. Yeah, for. yeah. Right. Uh, well, I, my my uh, love of Purdue dates back to the. You know, the early 50s, uh -huh. Dale Samuels uh, sure. was probably one of my first idols. Uh, I, I can still remember uh, winning a 50-cent bet for my uncle the day that Purdue upset Notre Dame in 1950 and snapped <laughs> their winning streak at 39. I didn't know what I was doing. I bet him 50 cents <laughs> and, uh, and won the bet. <laughs> first bet I ever made. <laughs> it was, was a good last, start. But it was the first one. Sure. Sounds but anyway, good. I, after leaving uh, Lafayette, we moved, to, we moved to Terre Haute. My wife was... Just about to pop with number three. In fact, we had our youngest was born in Terre Haute about four weeks after we arrived. Okay. After I got the family down there, uh -huh. I went to work for Holman and worked at, on the radio and TV and did the Indiana State basketball games and went to the final game that year. Got beaten the, champ the national championship game, Division Two. I uh, worked there two years and was having a crisis. Uh, mid, not midlife crisis, but early midlife crisis. Was this what I was going to do the rest of my life, and could I ever make enough money at it? Mm -hmm. And I, I gave myself a year to make or break it. And I got real aggressive on uh, interviews and stuff like that, or jobs or tapes that I, that, that I, you know, that I had to have. And, sure. Uh, I, I got lucky and uh, landed a job in Denver within three or four months after I made that pledge to myself. So I never know. What would have happened in my life is that Denver gig hadn't come along. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> but that's when I left the state, went to work for the, the Denver radio station out there. For one year, I did the Broncos uh, in the old AFL. That was the year they, that was they had merged that year, but they didn't play until, together until the next year. Okay. okay. Uh, the first Super Bowl started in '69, so uh, I was there for one year, and then I moved to Phoenix, did the Suns for a couple of years, and the second year I was in Phoenix, a guy that had been driving through. Uh, Denver, when I was doing the Bronco game, they just heard me on the radio, and they were looking for a guy to do the uh, Minnesota Vikings radio broadcast. And he said, I don't know who that guy was, but I really liked him. Well, he did some calling, and he, he, they tracked me and, and down to Phoenix. Turns out I was back in Terre Haute. It was a, uh, during the summer, and we were back on a vacation. Uh -huh. And they called me there and said, would I be interested in the Viking job, freelancing the Viking job? And Needless to say, I was, and sure. I got permission from the people that I worked for in Phoenix. Uh, so I wound up uh, traveling in and out, freelancing the uh, Minnesota Viking job that winter, and then doing the Suns games. Uh, missed a few Suns games when there were direct conflicts, but there weren't all that many, maybe four or five. Uh -huh. And uh, that's, that's what I did for the next couple of years. And then uh, I moved back to Indianapolis and uh, did the Pacers. Mm -hmm. Okay. How'd you like those winters up there in, uh, with the Vikings? A little cold, right? You know, uh, the, they were, I was in and out, so oh, okay. it was very cold, and I, did, I didn't live, in fact, I was living in Phoenix at the time when I started, oh. and, then, and then I moved to Indianapolis and kept that part of it, so okay. uh, my, my uh, weather sort of evened out, and I'll tell you that the blizzards of 78 and 79 in Indianapolis were the worst and we I've had it here in. too. I, I've never, I've never been. Uh, I spent uh, several, a couple of years, three years up in uh, Minnesota, uh -huh. living in Bloomington, uh, doing. That's when my baseball started. Okay. And and I lived there full time, and it was colder 
by spells, but we never had the snow that we had in Indiana in 78 and 79, the last two years I was here before I moved out. Sure, okay. It was unbelievably bad here. Yeah, I remember that. We had it here, too. Yeah, well, everybody right. had it. I That's mean, right. We were, buried. we were buried for weeks. That's right, exactly. <laughs> well, I never had anything that bad in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you uh, tell, uh, how about some of the Super Bowls that you did those as well, didn't you? Three and four years with the Vikings and okay. missed the Super Bowl shuffle Bears team by one year when they changed stations and I went back to Minnesota. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I had broadcasted the Bears for six years up until the year they won the Super Bowl, but I was uh, I was in the height of the Viking success when they had the purple people eaters, the line, the defensive team they called themselves, and sure. uh, Fran Tarkington, a lot of great players up there, and they went to three Super Bowls in four years, but they never led. They never led in any of them. They lost all three. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a fun ride, and sure. I got to know a lot of great players and saw a lot of great players. A lot of them are in the Hall of Fame now. That's right, exactly. How about a little comment on the, you did some of the things with the baseball, the Twins and the White Sox. Well, baseball, I grew up, that was the first thing I became a fan of back when I was a kid, and sure. I became a Cub fan from those days, and uh, I never did fulfill my number one uh, goal in life of being an announcer of the Cubs, but I came close. I did sure. the White Sox for five years and the Twins for two years, and uh -huh. Uh, the 83 White Sox uh, were uh, the American League Western Division champions. That was the first championship of any kind they'd won in Chicago since the White Sox had won a pennant in 59. So needless to say, it had been a long drought in Chicago in baseball on both sides. But they, uh, they, did, win the, they w did win the division that year and then got beat in the uh, playoffs by Baltimore. But uh, I, had some, I had a lot of fun doing baseball. Baseball was... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really glad I got a chance to do some of it because sure. I, I still love the game today. It's funny, after I got out of it for a while, I, I kind of lost interest except for maybe the playoffs for a couple of years. And then you find yourself in baseball more than any other sport of drifting back to the team you first originally associated mm -hmm. with, and I've become a big Cup fan again. I'll, <laughs> I'll forever be disappointed, apparently, in my lifetime. But at the same time, uh, you're, you always go back to your roots in baseball, sure. more so than in basketball or football or any other sport. Yeah. I don't know why that is, but it is true. Interesting part, interesting comment. <laughs> um, do you want to talk, should we move on then about uh, the, when you came back to Purdue, how that came about, and start, share some of that? Well, I can throw in a couple of other things in Good. there. I, okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, did the, I did the Colts for three years. Um, uh, also when, they did, came, when, when they came to Indianapolis? Yeah, well, okay. oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. It, was, it was after they'd been here quite a while, and okay. they, they switched radio stations, and somebody else got caught in a switch for a change, and then I lost it three years later for the same deal. Okay. But that's about the time I started during Purdue, was right after the Colt gig ended here, but then I also, first couple of years I did the Boilermakers, I also doubled as the uh, radio voice for the transitional uh, Oiler franchise that moved to Tennessee. The first year... Uh, we broadcasted their home games. They played in they played in the Liberty Bowl, which is one of the worst dumps you'll ever see. But it's the Liberty Bowl in Memphis, and then they moved to uh, Vandy Stadium in uh, Nashville the second year while they were building their new ballpark. Oh, okay. And I was a radio voice for those two transitional years, but I was doing Purdue at the same time, so oh, okay. I was pretty busy on the weekends. I would say so. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I I got the Purdue job. Jim Brujink, who was a longtime employee there, had known me for a long time, and we had talked several different times about the Purdue opportunity and everything. In fact, I've got a copy and going through some stuff of an old letter that I wrote George King suggesting they hire one guy to do a whole myriad of things for the Boilermakers, laid it out for him, told him how much I thought the guy should make in the whole nine yards. Uh, I still got a copy of that letter. It's a pretty damn good letter. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it from the content you're telling me. I agree. <laughs> uh, but but George, George wasn't too forward thinking in those days. It was one of those good old boy, uh, what are we going to do with a coach when he retires? We'll make him athletic director kind of days. Huh. And so it, it never got done. But sure. Brujink knew of my interest and knew that I'd, I'd love Purdue when I was, you know, growing up and came through the area and grew up in the area. And, so when the opening came, he called me, and I said, sure, I'd be glad to. And, and so for, for 15 years, I got, to, I got to live out my boyhood dream and do the Purdue Boilermakers. Isn't that great? I mean, I, I went to heaven, and I stayed there, right? Well, kind of. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't for the money. Uh, let me put that first, first and foremost. It's not, it's, it's not a career-making job decision, but it was a labor of love, and I think uh, our entire crew is that way. Pete Quinn... Uh, uh, invest more money in season tickets than he makes during the ball games and okay. he's largely responsible for a lot of the a lot of the old-time football players for coming back to these various events he keeps in touch with 
literally hundreds of them. That's great. And and, and it's not easy to do. University. He does he does a better job of that than the school itself. Yeah. Let me um, ask you this: what what changes did they make then when they did the renovation? Uh, did it enhance the uh, studio thing that where you were up there? The broadcast. The, 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 yeah, the broadcaster. Or was it that, that when they made the rent? You know, when they did the renovation for the uh, Ross Aid. Ross Aid. Yeah. Oh, it's a, it's 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 a wonderful renovation. Uh, we're actually probably closer to the field, and probably a little bit better vision of the field, the view of the field, than the old booth when we were on the roof. Sure. But uh, we're up higher and uh, more down towards one end now on in the new press box. Right. But the but the facilities are wonderful. They're. Uh, uh, people have come from all over the place. Michigan is doing is remapping uh, Michigan Stadium, and they have been to Purdue several times to to check out and see what we did at the press box. There are a lot of things that we did. I think that we did right, uh, and I think that they're being copied. And uh, other people that are elevating their own uh, facilities sure. are looking at Purdue as a model. So yeah. uh, that I, speaks I think well. From that standpoint, it was a terrific improvement. It, it was a it's a great recruiting tool. Uh, I haven't been to many uh, 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 meetings or uh, dinners or things like that at, at the press box at the various levels, but I know that that goes on, and uh, they're wonderful facilities for the university. And I think this, I think this Mackey uh, right. uh, addition is going to add to that. Of course, that's going to give them uh, better training facilities, but it's also going to be they're going to have the Hall of Fame there, and it's going to be another recruiting tool that I think will help. Right. That's right. Um, I think one thing I one thing sorry. I, I got to say about Morgan Burke uh, and my association with Morgan, Morgan has probably done the best job of any AD in Purdue history in terms of of rebuilding the facilities and and keeping them current and making them competitive with the other facilities in the Big Ten. I think he has done a remarkable job. Yeah, well, that's very nice. I appreciate that. Um, you uh, t can you talk about the Rose Bowl and you mentioned in one of the notes things that I read that Tiller you enjoyed working you know his while he was the coach well uh, Tiller was uh, t uh, Tiller was kind of a two-edged sword I mean he, he, he was he tried too hard to be funny sometimes but he genuinely is a funny guy he was better off sometimes when he let it come naturally but Joe is a is a definite personality type right and uh, I enjoyed Joe a lot um, I, it was funny because Pete and I, and we've claimed publicly we haven't hit back from this, but when, when they first named Tiller as, as the Purdue's new head coach, neither one of us thought very much of the, of the, of the hire, quite frankly. Uh, Joe had had a couple of successful seasons in Wyoming. Uh -huh. Wyoming, you know, uh, using the spread offense. You don't, you don't uh, spread the field. You don't throw the ball over the lot in the Big Ten. That was, uh, that was more or less the prevailing thought at that time. And it had been tried a couple of times. It wasn't like nobody had come in there and, and, and hadn't tried to open up the offenses and throw the ball all over the lot, but it hadn't worked. And uh, Tiller, his Tiller's previous tenure at Purdue had come at a time when Purdue's football fortune had gone downhill in a hurry. Yeah. He and Coletto were on the same staff as assistants when Leon Bartnett was there. Right. So, you know, we were kind of scratching our heads. But I tell you, and, and, and we've, we've said publicly many, many times it was probably the best hire that they could have made. And sure. Joe, Joe will go down as one of the most influential coaches in the modern history of the Big Ten because until the time he got there, it was a three-yard and a cloud of dust league. And now everybody's using variations of the of the right. spread offense, and everybody's throwing the football. Sure. Let me. Uh, when you go to the away games, do you, tra who, do you travel together with the broadcasters, or how does that work? Uh, yeah, we there? normally travel together. We okay. normally travel with a team. Oh, do you? Uh, okay, I was going to ask you that. Pete Quinn loves to drive, and so as as my as I got sicker and sicker of those uh, uh, chartered flights, <laughs> yeah. which are just awful, uh, I would go with Pete more and more. And there were there were a lot of times when we'd drive if, if we were going to Michigan or Michigan State. Once you got in the conference, uh, unless it was uh, Wisconsin or not necessarily Wisconsin, but uh, Minnesota, Iowa, or uh, Penn State. Penn State. We drive. Oh, okay. And we could right. be home. Bef we could be home before you, before even the team got sure, home. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, that's good. There's so many things I have to go through with clearance now on these charters. It's just unreal. Oh, okay. All righty. How about any peaks and valleys? I know one thing that you mentioned uh, that the uh, Drew Brees passed to Seth Morales when he beat they beat Ohio State. Well, yeah. that certainly was a defining moment in the right. program because that, that put us in the driver's seat for the Rose Bowl, and right. it came 
it came right on the heels of a, of a terribly thrown interception that, that had given Ohio State the lead. Sure. Uh, you know, to go from uh, yin to yang in terms of uh, emotions in that short span uh, is certainly an unusual thing. Uh, had that happen again in that, in that great uh, win down, down in the Alamo Bowl, the first year Purdue played in bowl in years and years and years, or the second year, we played, uh, we played two years in a row, and Tiller's first two years we went to Alam the Alamo Bowl in uh, San Antonio, which is a great place to have an event. That's what I've heard. And, and the first <laughs> year we played, uh, we beat Oklahoma State, which wasn't, it was a huge deal that we went anywhere and won a bowl game. That was a huge deal. The second year, we were back there again, and we all, all of us were loving to go back because uh, we, loved, we had a, such a great time the first time. And we were playing Kansas State, a team that up until the last week in the season had been ranked number one in the country. And uh, they lost their, their playoff game, and so they dropped to fourth, and they were not invited to a BCS bowl game. And so they were, they were mad as hell coming in down there. They didn't think that, uh, they, didn't think that they should be playing us and should be playing in Alamo. They, sh they should be playing one of the big bowls on New Year's Day. So it was kind of an unusual, uh, it was kind of an unusual feel to it. And we, we totally dominated the game, but we kept turning it over and keeping them in the game. And they finally scored on a couple of long plays in the fourth quarter, and suddenly they were ahead for the first time. And then we went down the field right away in the last minute and a half, and Breeze hit Ike Jones with a game-winning touchdown pass. That was his first big comeback drive. And, you know, he was legendary after that. Sure, sure, right. Yeah, good game. I, I haven't gone to the Bulls, but I certainly follow I'm wearing my Purdue regalia as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that sounds... Um, how about a couple of the? I wanted to tell you, talk about a little bit about some of the awards. You're the Indiana Sportscaster of the year 2000, and Illinois in 1981, and I think the Joe McConnell Radio Booth in the Ross Eight Stadium that you, was announced after the Michigan State game and the Sagamore. Well, you know, uh, comment uh, on those. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. the the, the uh, announcer of the year awards are nice. They're right. kind of a popularity contest. Uh, uh, it's funny. I call the Indiana one the Don Fisher Award because he won it like 15 or 16 times. <laughs> uh, a lot of people uh, vote they, the little towns. They vote for whoever they like, and that's that's fine. Sure. Um, it's it's nice to win one or two, and they have a nice uh, they have a nice association dinner for all, uh, uh, with all the uh, state winners. I'd never went, but uh, they have them in Salisbury, where their where their Hall of Fame, the Broadcasting Hall of Fame, is, and that's kind of a neat place. Um, the uh, Sagamore was truly a, a wonderful award, uh, and it represents a lifelong, uh, a lifelong um, uh, excellence, I guess. Sure. Uh, recognizing what I've done in my field, and uh, I feel very proud of that. I didn't expect it. Uh, didn't. It was. It was certainly a surprise. What did you do? Just show up in the booth, and is that how it came about? Well, we knew. Oh. You know, uh, oh. uh, Mitch always goes to the IU Purdue games. Oh, and, does he? Uh, yeah, but he oh. visits, he visits both sides. Okay. Uh, at the half, and he does this every year. So seeing him there didn't wasn't a surprise at all. We expected him there. Sure. Okay. But to uh, think that he was going to take that time to give to make an award and give me the Sagamore Award. No, I wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, Fred Glass, by the way, uh, the new AD down at Indiana, what a class act he is. I had never met him, and then they had honored me. Uh, Pete Quinn had put together a, a little deal of honoring me at the bucket luncheon when we had all the IU and Purdue people together down in uh, Indianapolis the week before the game. And, uh -huh. and I went up afterward. My wife, they had, they had arranged for my wife to take a day off from school, and a couple of my uh, Wednesday noon luncheon buddies showed up. I, all of this unbeknownst to me. I mean, I was just absolutely flabbergasted. And after the, after the thing was over, why, my wife and I went up to, to introduce ourselves to Fred Glass, and she says, Indiana, woo-woo, she's an IU grad, see? And so we told, that came out, and we talked, and I told him that I thought that, uh, you know, he's a little bit outside the box, but I thought that he was exactly, a, uh, with all of the hires that they'd had trouble with down there, that he was the right guy for the job. Mm -hmm. And he thanked me, and he was a very nice guy. And then, lo and behold, that weekend, they, they had a... They had a uh, an engraved chair, an IU chair that fits in our bedroom. Oh, wonderful. They presented with me that at the press box. He wrote a very nice card. They had my name on the scoreboard, and the entire group of uh, almost 50,000 people that got up and applauded. Uh, this is from my arch, <laughs> arch rival, Indiana. But you're uh, Indiana. That was really, you know, that you're was a really Hoosier. cool, you know. <laughs> totally, totally unexpected. So, Isn't that? That's great. You yeah, know. I, the, that, the two-week period after, I, after they, everybody made 
there was known that I, that I was definitely doing it, uh, definitely retiring. It was uh, it was really a neat time. Sure. And it was kind of hectic, and it was very surprising. Everybody knew everything but me. I was the biggest sucker. That's sometimes hard to to avoid, you know. Sometimes. Uh, well, I guess. Worst slips I up. <laughs> <laughs> now people ask me, "What are you going to do now that you're retired?" And I said, "I won't know until September." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. Well, people do it, and I think one of the comments that, you know, radio was your primary carrier. You got interested, in, and you you really sculpted your style by printing the words, and and I'm sure you're going to be continuing on doing something. Maybe not, with not as much travel, though. Is that what you're thinking? Well, I don't. Well, I tell you what, I don't like going anywhere anymore. Sure. Uh, you well, know, you stay not, close in hand. Yeah. I used to. I, see, I worked three sports. I did. I did something that I don't think any other broadcaster's ever done before. But at the height of you know, when I was doing games practically every day, I worked for three different fifty thousand watt clear channel radio stations in Chicago at the same time. Wow, that's I something. Did, I did. I did White Sox baseball on MAQ. They were owned and operated by NBC. I did the Bears on BBM Radio, that's CBS. And I did DePaul basketball the first year after Ray Meyer retired. He was, in fact, he was my color man. And his son Joey took over the team. And DePaul at that time was the, was the consummate uh, college basketball team in the country because that was before ESPN. Sure. And they were on WGN TV. Hmm. And so they were, they were everybody's fair-haired boys. I mean, they were recruiting coast to coast. They sure. ranked the top five every year right. yeah, for about I a remember. ten-year span there, where they had where they had all the advantages of TV, national exposure. Sure. So I was doing. I did. I figured it up. I did about 215 events that one year. Wow, that's that's a some kind of record. Yeah, it's not I easy to surpass. Well, like I said, I don't think anybody's ever. I mean, people have done that many events, maybe, but certainly for not for that many bosses in, uh, in the same market. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And I've, and, and twice I worked uh, mixed double headers. In other words, I did the same. I did two different sports the same day. Oh wow! Football, baseball, doubleheader, if you will. Uh, <laughs> it happened when the White Sox were in the playoffs. The Bears, uh, uh, the Bears had a regular season game, and it was a Sunday in Chicago, and they they moved the uh, the start of the game three of the playoffs with Baltimore back, and made it a night game at at six thirty, I think. The Bears played at one o'clock, and I did the Bears game. Uh, in the afternoon, and then just drove down to Comiskey Park and did the White Sox game that night for a different station. Oh my God! And Funny. earlier, I had done that when I lived in Minnesota, and um, doing the Twins, and uh, had started doing the Chicago Bears, and the Bears were playing the Cowboys, and the Twins were in the were in Arlington playing the Rangers. <laughs> Boy, so that that's some kind of work. Was on in the afternoon, and then I went, I got a cab and went down to Arlington and finished up the Twin series. Oh, wow. That's something else. How about that? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think too many people have done that either. <laughs> I don't think so either. No, I don't think so. How about family? Uh, do you have uh, children? And uh, did any of them come to I Purdue? Have a, I have, uh, and they all live in exotic places. My daughter is a uh, Edward Jones broker. She okay. has three kids. She lives in North Phoenix. Okay. Uh, for several years, she lived up in Sedona. Uh, my oldest son, Mike, lives in Scottsdale, about 10 blocks from where my mother used to live and about eight blocks from my, from his mother's place. And then my youngest son, uh, Kent, married the uh, middle daughter of the former CEO of uh, Waste Management International and founder of Aloha Airlines. And he lives at the base of uh, Diamond Head in Honolulu with his wife and two boys. Oh, wow. you got a lot of warm climates you can visit the family. Well, you know, the only time we've been to Hawaii, we went with, uh, uh, took Susie. It's the only Purdue game she saw in the 15 years that I brought, or I broadcasted the Purdue games. And we went to Hawaii okay. and spent, uh, made about a two-week trip out of it and spent uh, some holidays with my son and his kids. Oh, well, that, that worked around then. Thanksgiving. Sure. And uh, that's the only, I, I didn't really care for Hawaii. But anyway, I've been out there one time. Now I go to Arizona every year. You know, sure. it's a little, a little easier to get to. Yeah. I think so, right? But I'm, I'm not going to travel too much. I know that my wife probably would like to travel more than I do because she hasn't traveled as much. But right. when you've traveled for a living as I have, and I, you know, I used to change flights through two, two or three times a day, do two events in the day, plan your airport arrival a half hour before the flight takes off, get on your plane and take off. Uh, you can't do that anymore. Yeah, I know. You just it, it, cannot it, it, do it anymore, and it'll never be that way again. Yeah, I know, right? What, That's what, part. what um, as you look at the at broadcasting and the and athletics and the radio, do you, uh, let you 
kind of make some closing comments if you like. Any there was something that I forgot to did not ask or you want to expand on a little bit. Well, I don't know. I've done so much over the years. I always told people that, that I couldn't hold a job. <laughs> 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 but I feel, I feel very, very fortunate. I, you know, I knew when I was 10 years old that's what I wanted to do. Sure. I knew I wasn't going to be good enough to be a professional athlete. I was going to be lucky if I made the high school team, which I did do. But, uh, you know, I started making up games as a kid, and, and my folks got a big kick out of it. We didn't have a business phone. We had an intercom system between the house and the shop, what we called... Uh, dad's business, the Culligan business, which was in behind the house. Uh -huh. And if somebody called the house, uh, they wanted to talk to Big Joe, my dad, Mrs. Joe, my mother, or Little Joe, me. And so uh, if my dad was in the shop and we had a telephone call, we'd use the intercom to get him to come in and answer the phone. Okay. But they used to, since I was such a, since I was so good at sound effects and had such an active mind, they used to have me entertain some of their people that come over for a little bit at a time. I would make believe do a make believe radio broadcast of a of a ball game over the intercom system complete with sound effects yeah that was <laughs> good start that's, that's okay going, that's going back a ways that's but it. everybody that when i go back when i go back from my uh, alumni association my high school alumni association i graduated from goodland the class of 57 uh -huh. and i still go try to get back up there once a year uh, my parents my sister are buried in in goodland cemetery uh-huh um they all, all, the, all of my classmates always said, well, he always knew what he wanted to do. <laughs> and that's, that's what they say when they, they bring, if you bring up my name. They say, well, he, always, he, got, he got exactly what he wanted. He went out and got it. That's right. Well, and, that's where uh, you made so your mark. I feel mark. Very, very lucky. Um, you know, would I do some of it over again uh, a little differently? Possibly, probably. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I think I look back over all, of, all the things I got to do and see and be a part of in a small way, um, uh, I don't think I'd change much. Right, you're living your own dream, which is really good. That it, is, it, and, uh, I, and, but, and that's but key. You know what's, what I think is even deeper, because some people ha have got it all and don't realize it. Mm -hmm. That's true. And those people, those people I feel really sorry for. That's right, exactly. Uh, right. I, I was lucky enough to, to really enjoy what I had. I didn't have any aspirations to make millions of dollars or spend millions of dollars. Get, have millions of dollars worth of things particularly I wanted to be comfortable and wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do and I've been able to do that but I also wanted to live a somewhat comfortable life and I've been able to do that too. Yeah. Very good point that's very nice. Joe I want to thank you very much and I hope when you if you come to campus sometime you'll allow me the opportunity I'd love to get together with you and meet you and, and have lunch if that's okay. That, that would be wonderful I, I got one other little side note you might be interested in since good. it involves Purdue. Okay. But um, I have an aunt and uncle my oldest uh, aunt on my mother's side was a lifelong school teacher. Mm -hmm. And she married a young guy out of, uh, he was in the Navy, and they got married right after the war. And he was a school teacher. He was from Wisconsin originally. And they lived in Akron, Indiana, which is up in Fulton County. Okay. And they both taught, I think they had over 70 years combined when they both retired. Well, my uncle came down to Purdue after he had taught, uh, he was an ag teacher and a shop teacher. And he was the assistant uh, uh agricultural agent in Fulton County mm -hmm. and he decided he had enough of these big mouth high school brats and he wanted to teach he wanted to teach grade school so he came to Purdue and in the course of a summer or two got his got his master's degree okay which enabled him to, to start teaching in the upper grades not not high school but like fifth grade sixth grade well anyway to make a long story short they, they, they both together had over 70 years in, in teaching they taught together in Akron for a while, and they also taught quite a bit at the end of their careers in Wabash together. And they had no children. They had uh, two nephews that grew up in the same town that they did from my mother's uh, middle sister. And they were like the kids to these two aunts, this aunt and uncle of mine. Sure. And then they had other nieces and nephews. Well, they died. They, they finally both died, lived into their 90s and died a few years ago. And one of my cousins called me and said, uh, we've been invited to come to Purdue for a donor's dinner. Uncle Al and, and, and Eva have given money to Purdue. And I said, oh, that's great. I was having a knee replaced at the time, and they gave me a date. And I said, I didn't think I was going to be able to make it. But I said, give me a call after you've been there. And he says, well, he says, you know, I think, I think they left Purdue a million dollars. And I said, well, 
I said, geez, that, that's, uh, that's kind of crazy, but, you know, at the same time, they, they were very frugal, and we figured they had some money, so I didn't think that was that out, out, outlandish or unusual. So he called me back about 10 days later after he'd been to this deal, and I said, well, how'd it go? And he said, well, I met the school president, Frances Cordova. <laughs> uh, I said, oh, that's nice. Yeah, she was at our table. I'm thinking, oh, really? <laughs> you sat at the president's table, huh? Well, that's even nicer. So he goes on, and he strings me along a little bit, and he says, uh, how much do you think Uncle Al and Aunt Eva uh, gave Purdue? And I said, oh, I don't know. You thought they might have had a million dollars. He says, how about four million dollars? Eva and Al Matheson are my aunt and uncle. And they, they donated about four years ago $4 million to be used in scholarships to Purdue. In the, and and they, they earmarked it originally for Fulton County. And, well, with that kind of money, there's no way everybody, every kid that came out of Fulton County could go to Purdue for 10 years, you know, sure, one sure, of those deals. Sure. So the university said, why not, let's make it an area gift. So they had expanded to about seven counties. Wow. How and the way that? I understand it, and the way it was explained, that this year I think was the fourth year, wow. and they are now paying for 50 kids to go to Purdue every year. Wow! Isn't wow? What a legacy! Oh, what a legacy for two teachers to live. That's right, exactly. <laughs> what? Oh, that's wonderful. I got, I got, I got, I got a little bit out of the deal, which was fine. I wasn't expecting anything, even if I was the oldest nephew. Sure. I knew that the two that lived in the in 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 town got a lot more than I did, and that didn't bother me at all because sure. they were like sons to them, you know? Right. But none of us had a clue that they had this kind of money. Yeah. What? But That's he said that my uncle, my uncle invested every year a little bit of uh, uh, oil stock. He got into oil. Okay. Now, you multiply that by about 30 years. And you do doing and, that. And it's two, two school teachers driving a five-year-old Ford station wagon living in the same house for 30 years could have four million dollars well they had more than that but say say five million dollars in the bank wow that's that's pretty good very nice and the students will be our benefit by it so they their oh, legacy absolutely. lives on absolutely so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that too yeah i would say so that's very good <laughs> joe thank you very much i'm gonna uh, don't hang up yet because i want to make a comment i'm going to cut off the recorder for a second okay, okay? all right